this together and for providing this technical platform that we can use to have interactive sessions and to talk about important issues um, while we're dealing with a virtual legislative session. So again, I'm, I'm excited to, to be able to host you all today. And um, oh, it looks like we may have lost Secretary Gurginsky, so. <laughs> it's okay, we can always continue on with Secretary first. <laughs> All right. Well, I will just say welcome and I will go monitor the chat room and um, take um, text and email questions as well and have them for you after your panel presentation. Thank you, Kathy. Secretary Stewart, do you want to go first? I will. And I'll just uh, keep my fingers crossed that the virtual goblins don't don't get me uh, like they got Secretary Grigensky. I'm sure we'll be right back. All right. So let me uh, share my screen. All right, and it looks like that is working. Secretary, thank you. Okay, let me get it to full screen mode. Sorry, one second. And we appreciate everyone's patience. This is a new virtual platform for us on top of everything else we already have downloaded on our computers. And I can't see any of you as I'm presenting, so uh, I'm sure Stephanie will just yell at me if uh, anything seems to not be working correctly. But um, I'll just quickly go through some of the important priorities for the New Mexico Public Education Department. Uh, hello to all of you who have joined in. I'm Ryan Stewart, Secretary of the New Mexico Public Education Department. And as we come into the, or I shouldn't say come into, as we're uh, halfway through the legislative session here now, um, there are four strategic pillars that really um, form the basis of the, the work that we try to do and the policies that we try to advocate for. Um, and the first one that you'll see there is around making sure that we've got great high quality educators and staff in every classroom in the state with a strong educator ecosystem to support them. Um, making sure that all of our students have equitable access to opportunity and that we're removing the out of school barriers to learning that we are creating strong pathways for our students from the time they enter our system through the time they graduate high school so that they can be prepared with a relevant experience that is both exciting for them and that prepares them for the college or career of their choice. And finally, that we're addressing the whole child. And so that in addition to the critically important academics, we're also taking into account the, the linguistic and the cultural and the uh, special needs and the other assets that our students bring with them every day into the classroom and that we have a, an education system that will meet them uh, with their needs and build on the assets that they, that they bring. So with that, we have a, a set of legislative priorities and I'll go through them rather quickly because I know that there are a lot of questions that we're gonna dive into and robust discussion. And Secretary, they, as you had noted, Earlier, I'm not scared to jump in. Are you switching your slides? Because we're still on the first one. I am switching my slides. Um, interesting. Can so you escape out of full mode and potentially just click the slides on the side while you're doing it? Because I think when we expand it to the full mode, it's not showing your slides. Okay, we will do. Let me reshare and I'll do it that way. Okay, so we can see the second slide. Let's keep it like this and just uh, collapse your notes. And Steph will probably have to do that for the higher ed presentation as well. All right, Secretary, I'll give it back to you. All right, thank you, Stephanie. So the, uh, the current priorities include the list that you'll see here and I'll talk about them each in turn. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we know that um, we were looking at a, a very uh, dire budget projection. I think we've been fortunate that that uh, the projections are looking better, so not quite as uh, dire as what they might have been, but still it, it requires some tough choices to be made, and we want to make sure that we continue to build on our recent education investments and not move backward with regard to our education spending. Uh, in addition, one of the priorities of the executive has been a, a hold harmless provision. We know that this has been an extraordinary year um, given the pandemic and the and the implications that has for enrollment across the state. So we have been working to try to make sure that that districts and charter schools have the budget certainty that they need to uh, maintain programs and maintain staff. 
We've also introduced uh, and worked with um, the legislature to uh, to introduce an exciting bill, which is now Senate Bill 17, which would which would for the first time implement a new vehicle to the um, to the education funding formula. It's called the Family Income Index, and in short, what the Family Income Index does is it takes a targeted and strategic approach to attacking the issues of concentrated poverty in schools. So this index would allow the legislature to appropriate funding to make sure it goes to the schools in the state that serve uh, the students with the lowest incomes and highest needs in, in uh, proportion to the concentration of, of low-income individuals that they serve. We think this will be a really important tool to make sure that we strategically advance our, our agenda for equity for every child. We're also looking to continue the investments that we're making in our Native American communities by advocating for funding to support the Tribal Remedy Framework. This is a, a set of education priorities that have been developed by Native American leaders from across the state. And so we're proud to continue to advocate for funding to support those critical priorities. In addition, we're also looking at the obligations that the state has both legal and moral under the, the landmark martinez Yazi court ruling. And so we proposed an approach that would allow for uh, important Mar martinez Yazi related programs such as extended learning time and K-5 plus to be stacked with other important programs that are vital to these communities, including career and technical education and community schools. We also feel that uh, after decades in which the uh, issue of impact aid has been debated and discussed and litigated, that now we have the, the current momentum to finally end the taking of the impact aid credit, which will help get uh, additional funds, uh, not only to our uh, Native American districts, but also to other districts who are impacted by federal lands from, from around the state. And with that, I will stop sharing. I promised to be brief, and hopefully I was, and turn it back over. I see we have Secretary uh, Griginski back. Uh, I will turn it over to you for your presentation. Thank you. Secretary, I don't have I don't I don't have the share button. To, to. If you look at the bottom on your toolbar, it should be the third button after the microphone. I don't have it. All right. Go ahead, Stephanie. Yeah, we'll go ahead and do uh, higher education. Steph, can you go ahead and pull up the presentation for me? Yes, I can. Thank you. And as you saw earlier, we're having full screen mode difficulties. So go ahead and keep it in the PowerPoint presentation mode and we'll move through that way. Yes, I'm just as getting all, that set. As you can see, education secretaries are not immune to technical difficulties. So we appreciate your patience. Okay, can everyone see the screen? Yes, we can, Steph. All right, hello. I'm so excited to be here with all of you today. I am Stephanie Rodriguez, and I am the Acting Cabinet Secretary of the New Mexico Higher Education Department. I joined the agency a little late in the game on September 1st, and I have been responsible for the oversight of the department and the higher education institutions in addition to our COVID-19 response at our colleges and universities. Next slide, Steph. Can you see the next slide? We can, thank you so much. So first point, COVID-19 has taken a toll on all of us, but especially our students. That is why we are asking for $1 million to our agency to establish or enhance existing programs at colleges and universities for mental and behavioral health services and suicide prevention. Social and emotional well being is critical in ensuring students can be successful during their time in college, and it is our responsibility 
to reduce stigma and remove barriers to allow our students to access these services. Next slide, Steph. I also want to emphasize the importance of supporting a robust teacher preparation system. And these education secretaries are no strangers to collaboration under our leadership. With the help of our colleagues at the Early Childhood Education and Care Department, we have been asking for support in enhancing early childhood education programs and curricula across the state. This will allow our agencies to work in conjunction with existing higher education programs to establish early childhood education endowments that will be central in looking over our existing curricula and create sustainable pathways for educational assistants to become teachers. As you know, we need teachers in several areas, but we are no strangers to the critical areas that we need to focus on right now. We need to recruit and retain educators that will support Native American, Hispanic, English language learner, at-risk, and special education students here in New Mexico. Next slide. And speaking of educators and teachers, I want to talk to you about what we have been doing to support our educators. Over the course of the past few years, the Teacher Preparation Affordability Scholarship benefited over 600 students in fiscal year 20. Additionally, there have been over 500 awards to date for the Teacher Loan Repayment Program. Supporting these programs are key to providing future teachers with the financial aid they need to carry them through higher education and beyond. Governor Lujan Grisham and my colleagues also support Rep Garrett's amendments to House Bill 22, Grow Your Own Teachers Act. This program started at 43 scholarships and is now estimated over 150 scholarships are expected for this semester alone. Great teachers help create great students and we get there by investing in these teacher preparation support systems and showing these students that we care and we will support them in their educational attainment. Next slide to our longitudinal data system stuff. Now, this is really exciting for me and my colleagues. We must make concerted efforts to support New Mexicans from the day they are born and onward. That is why there must be a focus on a cradle to career educational system, which has been a priority for our governor. The longitudinal data system will help educators and policymakers identify student challenges early on, make targeted interventions and investments, and determine what educational practices and programs drive student success from the early years into the workforce. Next slide. This is a partnership amongst key agency, two of which are here with me today, starting with the Early Childhood Education and Care Department, to the Public Education Department, our agency, and the finish line will be the Department of Workforce Solutions. And we'll go ahead and go to our last slide stuff. Another key initiative is the Opportunity Scholarship. I know you've been hearing about this one. The Opportunity Scholarship renews the promise of a tuition-free education at one of our public colleges across the state. It fills the gap left over from the lottery scholarship and other state aid programs and still allows a student to use other federal aid, such as Pell Grants, to cover the cost of attendance, including books, housing, and childcare. The program has impacted nearly 5,000 students last semester, and I'm excited to announce to you all today that we have made the important and vital decision to expand this to bachelor degree program on top of certificate and associate degrees pending the passage of Senate Bill 193, sponsored by Senator O'Neill and Representative Garrett. Our agency estimates that with the Opportunity Scholarship, we can have an impact of up to 50,000 students across our colleges and universities. Additionally, New Mexicans could experience a return on investment from the scholarship program of about $175 million through income tax contributions, GRT, and public assistance savings. Next slide, Steph. Thank you. Now, over the past couple of months, my colleagues at the agency have shared testimonials of the Opportunity Scholarship recipients with myself and the governor. But I want to share with you Ramon Trujillo's story from the University of New Mexico's branch campus at Los Alamos. 
Because of the pandemic and the news of becoming a first time father, Ramon made the decision to leave his job and go back to school. He was faced with the question of, can I afford this? After applying, filling out the FAFSA and gaining acceptance into the school, he learned that the answer was yes. He was able to leverage this scholarship to move closer to his goal of becoming a college graduate. Ramon is one of many New Mexicans who will be closer to achieving their goals and attaining a post-secondary degree. Next slide, Steph. While New Mexico's lottery scholarship has seen success during its 24 year history in helping students access and complete a college education, non-traditional students such as those who start later in life, attend part time or experience interruptions in their education may not qualify for those scholarships. That is why the passage of Senate Bill 135 is critical. For us to see the full impact of the opportunity scholarship in those students I talked about up to 50,000, and to ensure that students like Ramon can obtain a post-secondary degree and work. Senate Bill 135 will reduce the 12 credit hour requirement to six credit hours as intended in the original legislation we introduced last year for the returning adult learner. Because of the impacts of COVID-19, this will open the door for a multitude of New Mexicans. And my final point on the Opportunity Scholarship, Steph, if you could go to the next slide. Remember, we were the first state in the nation to offer a tuition-free education through the Lottery Scholarship, which closed the college attainment gap for well over 100,000 New Mexicans in its history. The Opportunity Scholarship will provide full tuition and free support to thousands of New Mexicans pursuing college degrees in public higher education sectors, in all public higher education sectors, while extending the impact of federal and institutional aid for all our students. We can be a nationwide leader again and a model in this country with a sound investment, which in return will transform educational access, improve lives, and bolster New Mexico's workforce towards a path of prosperity. And last slide, Steph. It's basically my slide to say thank you for allowing me to present to you this morning and share with you the vision of the New Mexico Higher Education Department and Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham. I'm looking forward to our panel discussion with my colleagues and you all. Um, Secretary Griginski, I'm gonna send it back to you to see if you maybe have a couple remarks before we go into the panel discussion. And actually, I do have your PowerPoint slides, Secretary Griginski, and Thank so you. I can go ahead and run through those for you so that you don't have to worry about figuring that out on your end. And so while I pull that up, I just want to go ahead and remind our presenters that if you have any questions, you can go ahead and enter those in the chat box on the right hand side. Following these brief presentations, we're going to jump into a panel where you'll get the chance to ask our education secretaries questions um, about what you've heard today or other things that are um, on your mind about early childhood, public K-12 and higher education. We've received some questions in advance and I know that we also have some members of the media that are out there listening. And so um, just to kind of give you a heads up, that is sort of how we will facilitate the panel portion of this event. Um, but without further ado, I will go ahead and pull up the slides for Secretary Griginski. Thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate the collaboration as always. So we are really proud to have in the state of New Mexico an early childhood education and care department. And we have officially launched July 1st. The picture you see here is our assistant secretary for Native American early education and care and her beautiful daughter, Lily. And it really says so much about the work that we have and the importance of investing starting early and building these healthy relationships in our families and communities. My apologies, Secretary. I am just going to interrupt you briefly because it seems that we have a bit of an echo. If I could just remind us um, to mute their microphones. How's that? How's that? How's that? It's 
still seems that there might be a bit of an echo, but I think we can work through it. Okay, well, hear me in stereo. So the next, oh, lovely, don't have a slide yet. <laughs> The next slide has uh, the vision and mission to just really sh share with you. Since July 1st, we have worked with all of the staff across the department to create our vision for the work. And we'll see here is our vision that all New Mexico families and young children are thriving. And our mission to achieve that vision is to optimize the health, development, education, and well being of babies, toddlers, and preschoolers through a family-driven, equitable, community-based system of high-quality prenatal and early childhood programs and services. We know that's a mouthful. It'll take a while to memorize the mission, but it was really important to the staff that it, we articulate how deep our work is with families and in communities if we are gonna achieve the outcomes we want for all young children in New Mexico. Next slide. I was fortunate to have Lieutenant Governor Morales and Secretary of State Toulouse Oliver co-chair a transition committee over the summer and had many of the cabinet secretaries, legislators from both the House and the Senate, Republicans and Democrats. Through a series of meetings, we were able to identify five street strategic priorities for our department in the next 18 months. First, we must grow more investments to address the needs of young children and families. And we must advance a diverse, well compensated and credentialed workforce. Third, we wanna increase quality of all of our programs and make sure that all families and young children have access to these quality programs. Fourth, we wanna achieve equity we know that for too long, too many communities and individuals and within our state have not had access to the decision-making, to the resources and the participation in the programs that they want for their community. And that is a priority of this department to make sure that happens. Finally, we wanna enhance authentic collaboration. This is with families, with educators, with community leaders, to really make sure we all understand the impactful and important time, the prenatal to five period of life. We know that by harnessing the knowledge and excitement of families, legislators, policymakers, and others, that we are gonna be able to really change the trajectory for whole populations of children in our state. Today, I'm gonna to talk just about the two first priorities because it's relevant to this session and also to the conversation today. The next slide talks about what happened at last legislative session when the New Mexico legislature and Governor Lujan Grisham signed into law the Early Childhood Trust Fund. We have established a trust fund of $300 million. Beginning this July, that fund will distribute to our department $20 million. Going forward, every year thereafter, it'll distribute 30 million or 5% of the corpus of the fund. So this is a real opportunity for us to achieve that mission, focus on these strategic priorities. And as um, Acting Secretary Rodriguez shared, this year we made a priority investment in our higher education um, institutions with a portion of these funds. We are also in very strong support of House Joint Resolution 1, which will help tap the permanent land grant for 1% to go to early childhood education and services. These two initiatives will be very important in achieving our first strategic priority of growing investments. The next slide shows the landscape of early childhood professionals that we're working to impact in our department. So as you can see, we're almost 14,000 professionals working across the state every day in childcare, serving babies six weeks old and children up to age 13. These are people working in, in their own home, 
They might be working in a small center and a large center or in an after school program. We also have New Mexico pre-K. We have teachers, assistant teachers, educational assistants working across the state to serve our youngest learners. Home visitors, our wonderful Head Start and early Head Start programs that are federally funded, federal to locally funded, but we work closely with them to make sure that they're able to access the higher education they need to achieve their credentials and to also best meet the needs of young children. We have early intervention professionals. They're working with our infants and toddlers with developmental disabilities and delays or who are at risk of developing delays. These are physical therapists, speech language, occupational therapists, developmental therapists. And finally, our consultants and coaches who are supporting all of those professionals within the settings with high quality professional development and other evidence-based interventions. Last year, we, um, over the last two years, New Mexico has been working on developing a statewide strategic plan the next slide will show you the cover of that statewide strategic plan, which you can find on our website. This is a culmination of thousands and thousands of New Mexicans who answered surveys, came to focus groups, participated in community gatherings, and through that needs assessment, we formed this statewide strategic plan, which we launched last month. I'm just gonna highlight the one, one of the six goals because it's related to our conversation today, and that's around the workforce. We have three key objectives around ensuring that New Mexico's early childhood workforce is supported to meet the needs of families and young children through an aligned professional development system and through compensation that reflects their level of experience and in training. We know that too many of our early childhood professionals are some of the lowest paid individuals in our state. The average wage for someone working in childcare right now is about $27,000. Many of them are making much less. So we know that we have to support and adequately compensate this workforce to make sure that their physical and social emotional well being is strong so that they can in turn support families and children. We've set an objective to increase by 10% annually the number of degreed and credentialed professionals working within the early childhood workforce. And finally, we wanna align our professional development, training and technical assistance across the array of prenatal to five early childhood programs and services. I look forward to your questions today and to continuing the incredible collaboration with my education secretaries the governor's office, and the entire education community in New Mexico. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Grigensky, Secretary Stewart, and um, Secretary Rodriguez. Those were some really exciting and informative presentations. And I wanted to thank you also for um, aligning your schedules, especially in the midst of the session and with the new technological uh, frontier that we're navigating here um, during the pandemic. Um, and we really wanted to make sure that we hosted this event as an opportunity to present uh, education as a complete spectrum from early childhood through career because our agencies actually do collaborate um, quite a bit. Um, but this is also a chance for you all to ask questions um, for our secretaries. And so now we'll go ahead and move into the Q&A portion of our panel. And so it looks like we have some questions that have already been submitted. Um, and so one of the first questions that we have um, is whether participants of the Opportunity Scholarship will also be able to access the currently available ECECD scholarships? Does anyone have an answer for that question? So the Opportunity Scholarship is an exclusive type of student or one type of uh, financial aid component. What it does do though, is it stacks financial aid. It starts with state financial aid. So if the ECECD component of the financial aid is considered state financial aid, it will stack on top of a lottery scholarship or state financial aid program. 
opportunity scholarship will place on top to fill that tuition and fee gap for the remaining fund balances. And then we can leverage that even farther by using federal funds over tuition and fees to be the cost of attendance. So we're talking transportation, books, materials, childcare, et cetera. So mainly opportunity scholarship fills any gaps that are left over that state aid cannot be applied to. Wonderful, thank you, Secretary. And there's also a question about um, Montessori scholarships. I think that's in the same vein. Whether uh, the scholarships would extend to Montessori, Montessori training as well. You know, Secretary Griginski, that might be more so your programming mm -hmm. and what your scholarships do, so I'll let you take that one. Yes, thank you for that question. We do support all professional learning and development, so definitely reach out to our department and we will make sure to um, connect you with, with the resources to do the Montessori scholarship. Thank you. And there's also a question as to whether the 619 special education preschool teachers and educational assistants are included in these um, professional development and scholarship opportunities. So I'll just say kind of a, a broad statement about opportunity scholarship. It's not exclusive to any sort of workforce, meaning that you can go to school for what you want to go to school for and opportunity scholarship will fill the tuition and fee gap so long as you go to a public college in the state of New Mexico and you were a New Mexico resident. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Helen um, asking how we can align professional development in early childhood and still work with a diverse population and trainers and early childhood teacher educators across the state. Or are we looking to use companies outside of our state or keep using our in-state trainers? Um, we, okay. We're planning to continue to build on the, the infrastructure we have in the state, but being able to leverage those consultants and coaches across the prenatal to five system to really have, make sure that all communities and all settings where young children are learning that they have an opportunity to have access to the consultants. So we're not planning to bring in people from out of state, but to really grow our own, as we say, and make sure that we continue to expand those coaches and consultants who are working with our educators Thank you. It's also a question from Anita Coles about, um, she's a student of the doctoral program. She has 107 credits and um, she wants to know she's taken out numerous loans and are there any resources that she can tap into for help with loans? She says she has applied for small business loans but did not receive any help. So Anita, thank you for that question. I, I hear you. We do have loan for service programs at the higher education department. Um, we can definitely provide you one-on-one -on -one assistance and support with our constituent services and financial aid team to see potentially what loan for service programs that you could qualify for once you graduate from your program and your university. So Steph, before we leave today, can you make sure that we provide our constituent services financial aid email so Nita can uh, directly reach out to Dr. Rommel and his team and get that support. Absolutely, and I will also um, share some more of our financial aid resource links in the chat box. There was a question um, about the Opportunity Scholarship, and so the direct link to our information about the Opportunity Scholarship has been listed there. Um, there is a question about, um, uh, Rebecca says that she heard, we're planning to increase the early childhood workforce by 10% annually with degreed workers. What is the plan to increase their wages? Thank you, Rebecca. That is one of the three strategies that we have in the department. We have a wage supplement program. This year in our budget, we've asked, the executive asked for four and a half million to support pre-K parity for those educators in community-based settings who have a bachelor's degree or higher. But overall, we have made significant investments in wage supplement 
and we'll continue to look at ways to increase compensation for the early childhood workforce who do seek credentials and degrees and make sure that those that pay matches that experience and education. Thank you, Secretary Griginski. There is also a question from James Barron for Secretary Stewart. With the Department of Public Education not offering a blanket waiver for assessment testing, what is the state's plan regarding that and how important is it that the education department said schools won't be held accountable for students' performance? <clears throat> Thank you, James. Thanks for the question. Um, very, very timely, as you know, the, the U.S. Department of Education, as was just shared, just said that they won't be offering a blanket waiver. Um, they did say that they would work with, um, dish, oh, I'm sorry, with states um, on a, on an individual basis. And so, there's still a lot to be determined about exactly what that means and what the implications are going to be for us as a state with our system. Uh, again, we think that we have a, a both an innovative and practical common sense approach to assessment here. Data is critically important for us to be able to make the right kinds of decisions and the right kinds of um, thoughtful considerations when it comes to resource allocation and support for schools and for students. Um, and we have extraordinary challenges in the administration of it in getting valid and reliable data, given that not every student will be in a building, that we have all sorts of the opportunity to learn and access to in-person instruction this year, so uh, so we're gonna we're going to balance those. Um, uh, again, we're hopeful that that our approach will meet the um, the standard that the U.S. Department of Education is setting, uh, but there's still a lot to be determined as we go into those conversations. Thank you, Secretary Stewart. There's a question from Kelly about what is the current status around ongoing professional development especially during COVID for K-12 educators? Is virtual working um, for normal face-to-face -face professional development? Um, so if I, if I understand the question correctly there, um, there's a general, a general question about how is, how is professional development going during the pandemic? And, and I think that we've, we've both at the state and at the district and charter school level have really stood up a lot of professional development opportunities for, for teachers. So that includes the partnership that we've had with CNM uh, on uh, various degrees of uh, training for online, uh, how to do online and remote instruction um, to um, our ongoing work in, in structured literacy, our ongoing work in computer science and a number of other fields. Um, so we do continue to offer all of those professional development opportunities. And we've invested in a statewide learning management system, um, which is called Canvas. And so that's available to every, every school and, and every um, educator in the state. And it's also, um, there, there are portions that are available to families as well, for families to go on and get tips and supports and tools for how to support learning in the home environment. And so through that, there are, are many different modules. We would certainly encourage every educator to go on and look at the, the kinds of modules that are there. Um, we, we think that um, uh, some of the feedback that we've heard from educators who have participated has been really encouraging, including um, uh, there was a, an op-ed in the Albuquerque Journal a few months back um, that, that really talked about the value of some of those. So we're going to continue to expand out our professional development options through that portal. And of course, we also look forward to being able to augment that with more face-to-face -face and job-embedded uh, work as we get closer and closer back toward um, more and more educators back in uh, physical classrooms. And Secretary Stewart, if I could just kind of tag on to that, I the fact that you've mentioned that you've partnered with higher education institutions to provide some of that professional development, but that just shows you the collaboration within our agencies with all sectors of education to make sure that our educators and our teachers are prepared for this work environment and they can also continue this, but also be prepared to come back for in-person learning as well. Thank you. Thank you. And speaking of collaboration, this next question refers to collaboration between ECECD and HED. From Jen, how will ECECD and HED work together to provide pre-service coursework that supports all early childhood professionals in working with families of infants and toddlers with disabilities? 
Thank you for that question. So my answer is this is one of the first steps, right? And we're so excited. If we want to see that type of professional development and investment with our educators and connecting to real families here in New Mexico, we got to talk about that curriculum and that curriculum development. How does that need to look so that it's New Mexican centric, right? How are we providing those services to our kids here in our backyard? And that's why it's important to do these investments within our higher education institutions, who I must also mention are doing amazing work um, surrounding early childhood development and programs right here. And it's accessible and it's attainable to so many families who are going to school and raising their kids as well. So it's step one of many steps in our collaboration, but we need to bring all stakeholders to the table, our presidents, our chancellors, our faculty members, our deans, and even constituents, you all, to talk about what is needed in that curriculum and that development in order for New Mexico, New Mexicans, and our little ones to be successful beyond early childhood, be successful in K-12, in their college aspirations and career aspirations and beyond. Secretary Grigginski, would you like to add anything to that? Um, I ditto what you said, and I think New Mexico leads the nation in many ways in our alignment between our two and our four year institutions as it relates to early childhood education really pleased to have an early childhood higher education collaboration task force in the state that meets monthly and these are the types of discussions that we're having how do we make sure we're preparing our educators to meet the needs of all children in all settings thank you thank you there is a question from Amanda about how will pay increases impact EAs in public schools who are also under underpaid but are required to have an associate's degree in early childhood education. I'm not sure who's best to, to tackle this question. Maybe it's a kind of a combination of all of us. Um, so I, I think in general, um, some of the same some of the same considerations that Secretary Gruginski talked about um, do have this transfer over to the to the public education K-12 side. Um, and we want to make sure that every school staff member um, has the ability to, to earn a wage that um, uh, allows them to, to lead the lives that they need, have the supports that they need, and is reflective of the contributions that they make um, to our children, oftentimes our most vulnerable children and our children who have the, the highest need. So um, part, of, part of our strategic work in the educator ecosystem pillar that I spoke of in the introduction is around um, the compensation part of, of um, both in the, our, our teachers, our, our instructional aides, our, our support staff and, and ancillary staff and so on. Um, and so, so I think it'll, it'll be ongoing work and um, the, the work that, that ECECD is helping to lead on this front will certainly be informative to um, some of the approaches that we can take in K-12. So I do see that there will be uh, a need for deep collaboration here uh, between the sectors but I pass it over to Secretary Griginski if you wanted to add anything else to, to this question. I, no, I think what you said is accurate. We definitely support all educators working with young children, again, regardless of setting. And we look forward to partnering with PED and others um, as we think of strategies to make sure that our educators teaching our youngest children in this very important period of development are you compensated into the reflection of the value they're bringing, the experience and the education. So we have work to do. I think as uh, Secretary Rodriguez said, this is our first step and we are excited to have three education departments working together on these very important issues. Thank you for that, secretaries. And Steph, if I can just add something critical to me and even my own success when I was a college student is financial aid, financial aid, financial aid in the form of grants and scholarships. So grow your own teachers, teacher preparation scholarships. Those are so critical for our educational assistants to get those so that they continue to make wages, but also have those scholarship programs if they want to continue on in their education to support them and give them those bumps in their salaries when they become teachers and educators. 
Thank you. Great answers all around. Um, Secretary Grigensky, did you have something else to add? Okay. Um, Hope says, I love the idea of a longitudinal data system. What specific data points will be collected and shared? I believe the, the individual was Hope. If I got that wrong stuff, please correct. That's correct. Okay, Hope, everything. <laughs> you know, we want to make sure that students, the day they are born, what services are they receiving? Are they beneficial? What's working? What's not working? When they hit the K-12 system, what support services are they receiving? How are they progressing throughout their K-12 environment? Have they had any stumbling blocks? And then we want to track, are they going to college or are they starting careers? Where are they? So this is going to be an intense collaboration, starting with these four agencies first, to really start to measure students' performance but also start to decide what practices have we implemented throughout time that have helped impact those students and drive them up to their career or educational attainment beyond high school, right? So we are, it's a very ambitious project, I will tell you right now, but we wanna collect as much data as possible for those quality-driven decisions for student and New Mexican success. Um, do any of my colleagues have anything to add to that? They've been absolutely critical and so helpful in getting the system started at our agency for the three of us and Workforce Solutions. The only thing I would add is um, I, I think it's exciting. There are so many questions that we have that really do span across our agencies in terms of what we need to be investing in and what's really working to make a difference and um, the ability for us to to have these integrated systems will will just be a monumental step forward. I love that you brought up into um, these systems. Our systems need to talk to each other. And something we've noticed in state government is we have so many data systems, but they don't necessarily communicate, right? So this is a step of getting at least the education and workforce sector on the same page with all of our comprehensive data and put it into one point where you can start to speak to each other for those valued investments and in quality decision-making processes in the future. Thank you. And I know that Secretary Griginski um, has, I think, a hard stop now at 1130. And so um, there's just one last question um, that I hope that you can answer briefly. Jennifer asks, um, you discussed ensuring that all early childhood programs are meeting a certain level of quality. What criteria is being used to determine quality and how will that criteria be assessed? It's a good final question. <laughs> we do have focus that we use in our early care and education settings, but we all know the quality of a, early, a child's experience is really that relationship they have with the professionals, the educators who work with them. So we're very focused on making sure that Early, or that educators are well supported, compensated, educated, so that they can in turn provide that responsive, nurturing, caregiving, and education to the um, children that they serve. So we look at different elements, but I think it's a great question and one that we will be exploring together with the early childhood community as we work to really invest in the workforce to make sure that they can show up every day be ready and prepared. I just wanna give a big shout out to all the early care and education professionals who've been helping families and children navigate through COVID. In many situations and challenges, none of us have ever encountered, but they have children and families at the center of their focus every day. So thank you for that question and for the opportunity to be here with everyone today and apologize for the technical difficulties. <laughs> Secretary. Thank you so much for joining us. I think Secretary Stewart and I will stay on for a couple more questions. Great. I was hoping you would say that because we have gotten a lot of great questions in the chat. Um, seems like folks are very engaged. And so um, Siddhar Atanasio with the Associated Press has a question for Secretary Stewart. Can you give an example of a specific area where you might ask for flexibility on the Department of Education's testing standards? Thanks, Cedar, for the question.
The biggest one here is the 95% requirement um, that is typically in place for the percentage of students that you would need to test through your testing program. Um, just given the nature of the pandemic uh, and the fact that we have limited numbers uh, of students in a building at one time and some districts remaining completely remote um, through, the, through the rest of the semester, um, meeting that requirement is likely to be probably the biggest challenge uh, of, um, of the, the normal testing requirements that are there. So that would certainly be one. And again, we have a, we have a proposal to, to create a representative sample so that we, we still get information. We still have state level information to look at that gives us a good picture of, of where our kids are. We've worked really closely with the, um, the Center for Assessment, which is one of the leading um, national organizations that does all things assessment to design the, the program that we would like to move forward with. So we're hopeful that um, that will be taken into strong consideration. Thank you, Secretary Stewart. I think this is another um, question that touches on collaboration, but Kevin Shendo asks, in the alignment of systems, how are native language teachers, immersion, dual language, bilingual, et cetera, being considered to be recognized as certified licensed teachers based on tribal criteria to be compensated at the same rate as teachers being licensed through a higher ed institution? Second, are there any efforts being made to develop native language immersion degree and licensure programs at in-state institutions to support tribal language revitalization, maintenance, and strengthening efforts. Stephanie, I, I can start with the, um, the certification question and maybe you wanna take the um, licensure question. Um, and, and it's a really, really good question because we know that we have a number of um, educators who are on uh, what we call our 520 license which um, uh, uh, enables them to um, utilize their, their vast wisdom and expertise and the, the knowledge of their native language um, and instruct um, individuals. But, but like, the, like, like Kevin said in the question, um, is not recognized as the same type of certification that, that many of our other teachers have um, and that has pay implications. So we have put this on, the, on one of the priority uh, as one of the priorities for the department to really look at this system and look at how we how we might better balance um, so that we that we create more parity among that um, that group of teachers so that they um, so that, so that this um, uh, situation doesn't persist into the future. So I appreciate you you bringing that up. And Stephanie. Hey, Kevin, thank you for the question. So higher education, we do have several institutions that do provide native language programming within their institution. Another thing that I wanna just mention though, is we've taken on the task to bring chief diversity officers and other individuals in different types of programs together to start talking about how do we create programming that is representative of New Mexico and New Mexicans and we are excited that we're starting those conversations in the higher education department and we will continue those after the session as well to bring those stakeholders in a room and say how do we support these programs and our students and not just one type of new mexico student all new mexico students i think that's been a little bit absent from my agency and that's something that i'm committed to doing with my deputy secretary dr patricia trujillo who we just brought on from Northern New Mexico College, who was actually the Director of Diversity and Inclusivity at her institution. So we're excited to have her do that work at our department. And if you have anything you wanna ask me, I encourage you to email me and send me some of your ideas on how we can engage in that and be better. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Rodriguez and Secretary Stewart. Um, Eric wants to know if you could speak more on the Opportunity Scholarship and how it would impact or help marginalized communities. Absolutely. So I love this question and I'll tell you why. I had a difficult time getting into higher education because of my adverse experiences as a child and what happened. And so when there's no programs to provide that access, you're left as a student in high school thinking, can I do college? Is it for me? Can I afford college? And many times we're stuck with this decision-making process at such a young age of, I don't think I can afford it and I'm scared. And so the Opportunity Scholarship is really meant 
to bring down those barriers like the lottery scholarship did in 1996. But it has diminished over time to anywhere of 60 to 100 percent of tuition and fees covered. But what happens with the opportunity scholarship is we fill that all in. But guess what? You keep to you get to keep your federal aid on top of that so that you have those extended costs of transportation, materials, and books covered. So you're now a student, you're in college, you're making the biggest decision of your life, it feels, at that moment in time. And I want that student to sit there and go, I can do this. I can do this. I can get my lottery scholarship. I can get the opportunity scholarship. And I can get all of my federal aid and afford the opportunity to go to college. Now, let me tell you why I love the Opportunity Scholarship, because not only does it think about that traditional high schooler for a high schooler who wants to go into an associate or bachelor's degree program, but it also thinks about that New Mexican that's in a different point in their life. They're an adult. They may be working full time. They want to get a bump in their salary. They're unable to do that right now. So they're able to go back to work part time, doesn't have to be full time, and get a certificate whether that's in the film industry, carpentry, architectural drafting, the possibilities are limitless. Or they can go back to school and get associate's degree in the healthcare medical field, solar renewable energy field. We need those people. We need those technical experts right here, right now. So Opportunity Scholarship brings down those walls and those barriers for traditional and untraditional students to know that higher education is attainable and it is accessible right here in New Mexico so that you can continue to be with your family but go to school in your own backyard. So that's really the vision for Opportunity Scholarship that the governor has and I have as somebody who was in that same predicament when I was 18 years old trying to figure out, can I go to college? And I'm gonna be honest with you, I thought no. But there were a lot of people who rallied around me to make sure I could. And I want to be that person who rallies around New Mexicans to tell them that they can as well. And so we're committed with Stephanie Montoya, our public information officer, after the legislative session, when we get this passed, to really start to talk about a communication strategy to get every New Mexican the opportunity to go to college, no matter their path. Thanks, Steph, for the question. And thank you for asking it. Thank you. And just for everyone's information, the legislation that is currently going through um, the Senate with regard to the New Mexico Opportunity Scholarship is SB 135. And so um, if you would like to see um, the scholarship expanded, um, you know, it's very important that we continue to receive public support on that. Um, I think this question is for Secretary Stewart regarding the pay parity proposal. Will degreed teachers also be required to be licensed to be compensated equally? Uh, and just to clarify, is this with regard to the teachers on the 520 licenses who are teaching the native languages? It just says regarding the pay parity proposal. Uh, assuming that we're talking about that same thing, there, there's a um, uh, some significant legislative details that we'll have to work out on exactly what the what those requirements will be and, and how it will operate. So um, a little bit early to say uh, at this moment what uh, what those requirements will be, if, if any additional requirements, um, but um, uh, certainly something that we're going to take a look at. Excellent. Thank you. And just because, oh, I'm sorry, it was regarding the ECECD pay parity proposal, but Secretary Griginski is not on the line with us anymore. So we'll make sure um, to follow up with you, Terry, offline with an answer to that question from ECECD. Um, this will be our last question since we're running out of time, um, but I'll go ahead and share some email addresses at the end here so that you can share any additional questions. But Kathy asks, from the educational system perspective, what are some of the best ways that the business community can communicate their needs? And also, how can businesses support the educational system, especially during the legislative session? Secretary, do you want me to take this one? Uh, you can start, First, I'll add in. Go okay. Kathy, I love this question. 
we need to do a better job, me, my agency, in coordinating industry and business to higher education and what you need at your business to make sure you can be successful. We need to align. I'll tell you, we've done that. There are many institutions that have done that. They worked with their local community business leaders to do exactly that. But we really need to build that momentum in a larger statewide effort because we need to support you all in recruiting and retaining New Mexicans right here in our own backyard. And how you can support me is let's make sure we have accessible options for our students to attain higher education. And that's scholarship program. That's uh, the opportunity scholarship. That's holding financial aid harmless right here in New Mexico so that I can produce those folks for you that can work in your business or your industry. So I, I love the question. We're working on it. Higher education has already done a lot of work at our institutions, and I'm excited to bring our agency forward to help with that dialogue as well in a statewide model that we can use. Uh, what I would just add to it is um, I, I think the more partnerships we're able to build with our business community, uh, and create pathways for our students who can really see the the relevance and the connection to what their next step may be, whether whether it's directly into career or into a post secondary. Uh, the better off that we're going to be, and so that's why we've been having uh, conversations with both HED um, and also Workforce Solutions. And and I think across all of the agencies, we've all been uh, very excited to move this type of work forward, formalize more partnerships, and continue to build these pathways for, for our kids to um, uh, interact with the business community and, and blur some of the lines between uh, work and school and career um, and uh, explore those opportunities. So uh, I think we'll, we'll um, uh, as uh, Secretary Rodriguez said, um, have a, a number of very strong ways that we can uh, deepen those partnerships and, and uh, build those, those systems. Perfect. I just want to offer on behalf of the hospitality industry, I can speak for that group at least today, um, that we would love to work with all of you um, on, on building those connections and helping to, uh, to create good pathways for New Mexico students and a great workforce for New Mexico businesses. So I appreciate your, your passion for this, for this work that you're doing and, and for the fact that you took a big chunk out of a busy time um, during the legislative session. And again, if there are specific, particular legislative initiatives um, that you want us to help you um, promote within the legislative session, um, please let me know and we will be happy to do that. Thank you so much, Kathy. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just echoing what you were saying, Steph, which is thank you, Kathy. We appreciate you all and all you're doing to make this accessible for New Mexicans at this time. Yes, thank you. I echo that. Wonderful. Well, you're welcome to come back anytime we have, um, we'll be here for three more Tuesdays um, and we are going to have a big wrap up session on March 16th. So if you would like to have space on that agenda, let me know and we would love to include you in that big wrap up session as we kind of know what's going to, what's going to come out of the session as, as we wind things up. Sounds Thank good you. to me. Thank you. And as, as a save the date, I also want to give everyone the heads up that, um, our Adult Education Division and Adult Education Programs in partnership with the New Mexico Adult Education Association will be hosting New Mexico Adult Education Day on March uh, 9th, Tuesday, March 9th, also here via the virtual roundhouse. So please keep an eye out for that invite um, as the date approaches. In the meantime, if you had any follow-up questions or didn't get the chance to have your question answered here, our contact information is up on the screen. Um, I also wanted to thank my colleagues, Brendan, um, Carolyn, and Sonia from our sister education agencies for their help in coordinating this event. Um, and so you'll see emails on screen here. Um, and I also put my email address in the chat box if you would like a link to the recording of this event so that you can share or review later on. And with that, we want to thank you again for joining us and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.